This is Malcolm Guy, the author of David's Crown, and you're listening to Pints with Jack. This is Pints with Jack, Season 5, Episode 59, The Poetic Spirit, After Hours with Reverend Dr. Malcolm Guy. Well, good morning, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast, where David, Matt, and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. Today, we begin our final dedicated series of the season, Poetry Month. In subsequent episodes of this season, we'll dive more into detail about Lewis's own poetic works, as well as those of his wife. While I'm sure we'll mention them today, this episode is going to be a wide-ranging talk about uh, poetry, especially Lewis's own. Many people haven't read poetry since they were in school, and few people, probably too few, have read Lewis's works. And who better to help us through this than the Reverend Dr. Malcolm Geit? Malcolm Geit appeared briefly on Pints with Jack, when he recorded a tribute to the late Walter Hooper. He's an accomplished poet and important voice in the Church of England and throughout the world, author of Mariner, a definitive study on Coleridge, and uh, one of the most inspiring speakers uh, uh, working on Lewis and the Inklings today. Malcolm, under trying circumstances, thank you for your courage and welcome to Pints with Jack. Thank you. Good to be talking uh, poetry in the context of uh, Pints with Jack, because of course Jack, uh, I think Jack was in the very deepest sense, Lewis was in the very deepest sense a poet, but he wanted to be a poet in the most literal sense. He wanted to be known and remembered as a poet, really the first part of his life, his first published book was a book of poetry. Um, he had hoped that his long, strange narrative poem, Dimer, based on a self-made myth, would, would make his reputation as a, as a great modern poet. Um, and sadly, within his own lifetime, that didn't happen. But thanks be to God, he didn't stop writing poetry. And uh, I'm among those who think that when you look now from the perspective of some years, and the dust has settled on so many, as it were, of the apparent contenders for great poets in the same period that he was writing. And you look at his works, which were only published posthumously in 64 uh, mm -hmm. by Walter Hooper, and then now more recently in a really fine um, scholarly edition by Don King. I think actually Lewis's reputation as a poet can only grow and mm -hmm. continue to grow. And I think a really strong case can be made for his being um, a better poet, certainly in some individual poems that, than, um, than he was given, ever given credit for, or perhaps that he even thought himself. Absolutely. And we have, um, we'll have Don King on, and I interviewed Jerry, uh, Jerry Root about mm -hmm. Nimer, and especially as the, 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 the study of Lewis has grown more wide, um, Lewis's poetry contains so many of those mm. themes, and sometimes in an unguarded way. Mm. I think of his kind of unstinting attack on modernism that you yeah. find more in the poetry than anything that he would Yeah, say. although I haven't said that. I mean, I think it's a bit non more nuanced than that. There are certain aspects of modernism as he perceived it that he wanted to attack. Sure. And um, Walter Hooper chose to begin the, the collection of the poems in 64 with a, a really rather lightweight kind of, you know, bit of Lewis having a go at Eliot and pastiching mm -hmm. Eliot and, you know, I've never been able to make myself yeah. see the evening like it. And it kind of uh, actually makes, it sets up entirely the wrong tone for our reading Lewis because it looks a little bit petulant and, and um, mm. you know, reactionary in the simple sense that he's saying, oh, I don't like all this modern dross, you know, and it's right. a bit harumphing, to right. be honest. It's not also, it's also by no means his greatest poem. I mean, <laughs> you know, so... Um, in fact, as is often the case when we look back from a long historical, the sparring partners of Lewis and Eliot, and uh, Lewis, you know, deliberately calling things Eliotic as an obvious play on the idiotic and so sure. on, but yet, nevertheless, of course, and it becomes a Christian. Lewis, nobody says, look, you know, Eliot and I may disagree about Milton, but we, in Preface Paradise Lost, he says, we may disagree about Milton, but we agree about something far more important. Mm -hmm. Both men, as it were, adopted Englishmen, one American and the other Irish, right, coming right. into both men hugely influenced and deeply concerned by a knowledge and love of the classics. Mm -hmm. Both men interested in archetypal underlays and patterns. Mm -hmm. The characteristic, mo I mean, Lewis is supposed to be against modernism, uh, and he, he mocks, he doesn't like Eliot's free verse, he doesn't like 
its allusiveness or its elusiveness. Sure. Well. But the characteristic high modernist move in terms of how do we shore these fragments against our own, how do we find pattern in an apparently patternless world, the characteristic move is to take a deep mythical or classical underlay yep. as the hidden floor plan or pattern Absolutely. of the modernist work. Absolutely. So you can see Eliot doing it with the Grail stories and the wasteland and calling it the wasteland. And and you can see James Joyce doing it clearly mm -hmm. with the Odyssey and Ulysses, the very title, a bit of a giveaway. Sure. <laughs> now, Lewis does that all the time. Yeah. Obviously, until we have faces, Absolutely. but, uh, you know, Michael Ward has brilliantly shown the wonderful underlays of his huge classical and early, you know, mm -hmm. Renaissance learning pattern. So I don't think there's quite a bigger, as big a rift as you thought. And obviously, Charles Williams is the link person sure. between Eliot and Lewis, and Eliot hugely admires Williams, as indeed Lewis hugely admires Williams. They both like the same things in Williams. Williams is someone who breathes Lewis's atmosphere and talks his world, but also totally gets Eliot's high modernism. Well, and that's uh, the slippery thing about Lewis, is that although he may object early on, and of course there's that famous, uh, the plot with William Forstead mm. to slip in some, some, mm. some, uh, some poems into the Oh, yeah, he wants to write parodies you know, and see if Eliot would Bridget and Rollo Considine. Yeah, but, right? but, but, uh, Eliot but he talks through it straight away. And he admits later on in his letters that he likes some modernist poetry. Oh, and yeah. Of course, he and Eliot famously get on. Yeah. And one of the cornerstones of my own work on Till We Have Faces, and, and I'll discuss by extension The Lord of the Rings, is I think it makes most sense to talk about them within the context of modernism if for no other reason that that was the period in which they yeah, wrote. Yeah, exactly. And they, so, they were carrying all those, those characteristics. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things that I tried to do when I wrote the chapter on Lewis as a poet for the Cambridge Companion to C.S. Lewis, I thought it was an interesting experiment in criticism, if I can use that phrase, to yeah. take um, the criteria mm -hmm. from Eliot's criterion, mm -hmm. um, the things which in his seminal essay, Tradition in the Individual Talent, Eliot talks about what poetry needs, what a contemporary poet needs to have, and they have to be an awareness of the past, but not just of the pastness of the past, but of the present moment of the past. Their writing must be affected entirely by everything they've read. Their writing must be, if it's original, must re re-affect the pattern of the literature. Mm -hmm. You have to write with the whole of the literature in your veins from right. Homer onwards. All those are things that Eliot says in the 1919 essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent. Right. And it's the very year, I think, in which um, Lewis is publishing uh -huh. his poetry. Yeah. And I said, well, let's just look at that and some of the, some of other Eliot's other critical dicta. And let's look at the best of Lewis's poetry mm -hmm. and see if, as it were, out of the mouth of an apparently hostile witness, see if it adds up as good poetry, not according to Lewis's, you know, romantic or neo-romantic sure. uh, theological or literary critic, but according to Eliot's modernist and neoclassical mm -hmm. Dicta, and I felt not all the poetry, but that a lot of the poetry, some of Lewis's poetry, certainly passed muster and mm -hmm. more than passed muster by Eliot's considerations. Yeah. So Lewis felt, because Eliot had, as it were, turned the stream of modern poetry away from its traditional, you know, moved it from the Georgian verse of the kind that, you know, it was like that he'd, as it were, condemned himself to be sidelined forever as a poet. Mm -hmm. But actually, he he wasn't. I think I think the streams come together again. Of course, later in their lives, they did, in fact, work together on the revisions of the Psalms. Uh, that, Absolutely, uh, and that's a, that would be a yeah, whole episode. Uh, yeah, well, Actually, the church never used that revision. It was never printed or well, included in they, the... It was printed, but they, yeah, they didn't incorporate it. And I've read some of the, some yeah. of the translations that they were, some of them are frightful. Um, when I was teaching modernist literature, we did, of course, a whole section on, you know, Wilfred Owen, Rupert Brooke, and all the, the, the war poets. And we talked about all the characteristics of the war poetry. Mm. And then for the final exam, I set an uncredited piece for them to analyze in terms of what we knew about war poetry. But what I did was Monchi Le Preux. I oh, used, yeah. you know, our throats can bark for slaughter and cannot yeah, sing. Cannot and sing. They, they, none of them had a blip. Of seeing that as characteristically one of the one, one of the, the oh yes absolutely and of course oh, Heinemann was, I think who published it was was, was um, Sassoon's and I think maybe Wilfred Owen's publisher so you know he he should be seeing those eyes but um, of course Eliot also says that although a poem exists in its own time 
it also exists always, however old it is, as a contemporary text. Mm -hmm. That 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 all poems compose, all everything that's been written thus far composes a simultaneous order. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, that's very true in Eliot's poetry, where some ancient voice speaks as though it were speaking beside you now, and you know, he walks through London in the Blitz, and Dante is walking with him. Um, so I think one of the things that's really interesting with the passage of time since Lewis's death and the huge changes is to take Lewis's poetry as it was written then, we know about its context, and say, well, how does it work as contemporary poetry? I mean, mm -hmm. and just to take one example, yeah, if you think so. of the poem, The Future of Forestry, mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about the whole the huge growing nature of eco-poetry, eco-criticism, the whole sense of our interrelationship with trees, what trees mean to us, and the kind of protest. I mean, when he wrote that, almost nobody was looking, apart from his friend talking at the destruction of the forests and making them. Well, and you bring that back to life in your Ash Wednesday poem, right? Yeah, well, I, yeah, and that's probably, you know, influenced by some, but just to give people a perhaps a, I mean, it's a beautiful rhetorical move where he, instead of saying, you know, if we keep on going like this, it's going to be bad in the future, it's speaking, he imagines a future mm -hmm. in which people look back mm. after trees have, are no more. He imagines a future wow. of people looking back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, with all these, we're a lot nearer to that future mm -hmm. than he was when he imagined it. Right. So we're living in towards a poem that was written in the past. So you remember, it, ends, it opens, how will the legend of the age of trees feel when the last tree falls in England? When the concrete spreads and the town conquers the country's heart, when contraceptive tarmac's laid where farm has faded, tram line flows where slept a hamlet, and shop fronts blazing without a stop from Dover to Roth have glazed us over. Well, we're not much, you know, we're quite close. Yeah. And you think the, the only poem I was aware of, you know, when I was a teenager in the 70s was. Um, the very fine poem by Philip Larkin, Going, Going, mm. which begins, I used to think that it would last my time. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then it was, you know, that will be England gone. And it's very, very like this Lewis poem, whether yes. he was aware of, you know, I mean, the Lewis poem wasn't, I think, publicly available until 64. Yeah, well, it was uh, collected then. Some of but, his poems, of course, yeah. he published it in But Larkin, Larkin wrote that in the um, late 60s, I think. So mm -hmm. it certainly could have been. Um, and, and then, of course, you get this lovely turn, having imagined a, a treeless future, mm -hmm. the poem turns and looks back and there's a summoning of mm -hmm. a beginning, which we hope will perhaps be a fun, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so yeah, shall we... a homeless time, though dimly catch from afar, for soul is watchful, a sight of tree delighted Eden. Eden. It's a wonderful poem. It's also a really interesting example of, of Lewis's craft. It doesn't appear to rhyme if you look at the end words of every line and you mm -hmm. think this is a piece of blank verse. And then you realize this is a subtle thing like, tell me, grandfather, what an elm is. Yeah. And the tell yeah. me an elm is. So elm, he's actually yes. um, rhyming words or, or echoing words at the beginning and ending of each line. And then he has mm -hmm. a series of rhymes across the middle of the lines. It's really extraordinary technical achievement, that poem. And that's so, one of the things that I certainly have always appreciated about Lewis's poems is just how crafted they were. I mean, he really strove and mm. I think gave so much of his, his so much of his effort to yeah. good. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, he's, he's a technically very gifted poet. But I mean, that's one example. And the other, the other things that are really interesting, I think, another point of connection with Eliot. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are several points of connection with Eliot. Sure. One of Eliot's most important insights the later Eliot, the Eliot of the Four Quartets, is when you come to the mystery, the mystery of div the divine presence and of the Godhead, lang word, language fails. Mm -hmm. And um, Eliot often talks about that. He says, words slip, slide under the tension, decay with imprecision, will not stay still. Uh, um, and then he, he, he writes beautifully and then he says, well, that was a way of putting it, you know, mm -hmm. a paraphrase you can study in a warm out poetic, you know, he's, and again, you know, uh, last year's words belong to last year's language and next year's words await another voice. And uh, there's a very fine poem of Lewis's called An Apologist's Evening Prayer, mm -hmm. where he does exactly that move. He talks about the inadequacy of even 
the best language right. um, from all my lame defeats, but so oh, much more from all the victories I seem to score, score on my behalf. behalf, at which, while angels weep, the audience laugh. From all oh my, my thoughts, even my thoughts of these, uh, thou fair silence, fall and set me free. But between that, he uses this really wonderful metaphor, mm -hmm. which is developed from a Shakespearean metaphor. Mm. So um, you remember Shakespeare actually also asking this question about can language be renewed? How, how is it used? Shakespeare says, all my best is spending, is, uh, my, all my best is dressing old words new, mm. spending again what is already spent, mm -hmm. which is the idea of language oh. as exchange and coin. Yeah, so, so, that's so, coins. so Lewis picks up that very deftly, um, thoughts are but coins. Let me not trust instead of thee their thin worn image of thy head. From all my thoughts, even my thoughts of thee, O thou fair silence, fall and set me free. So that's a really interesting idea that the thought with the, I mean, the, the coin, mm -hmm. which has stamped on it the image of the head of the sovereign, right. which is worn thinner and thinner every time the coin is used and taken mm -hmm. out, you know, the penny oh. with, with, with King George on it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the problem with language. It gets worn away. It becomes cliche. It, it, it becomes less and less. Let me not trust instead of thee thy thin worn image of the heads. So the best thought about God right. stands in relation to God himself mm -hmm. in the same way that the image of, of the king on a coin stands to the living king. Yes. I mean, that's, that's rating even the best poetry pretty low and quite rightly. Right. We know he doesn't despise language. He treasures language. Absolutely. But, yeah. Oh, thou fair silence, fall and set me free. There's liberation in mm. silence. And in some ways, poetry should lead us to the silence yeah. of God. But how does Jadis destroy Charn? Mm. Through the deplorable word, mm. right? And so I think Lewis is trying to redeem the use of words to point oh, yeah. us to the silence beyond. Well, the, it's, the thing is, this is a real case of first things and second things. Mm -hmm. What he's doing in that move is he's trying to make sure... Obviously, he loves language. He yeah. delights in words. He thinks poetry is marvelous. The reason why he says it's marvelous, but it's not adequate mm -hmm. for the divine, is to make sure that he puts first things, the actual truth of God, which mm -hmm. before which all language, first. Then you get the second thing thrown in. Once you realize that, then you have poetry to play with, and you become. And I was it was very interesting. I mean, one of the things that I've done in my own thinking and theology of imagination, theology of literature, a kind of central development for me, uh, which I thought, <laughs> I thought at the time was entirely original. Um, you know, it was when I was thinking about how, how um, Shakespeare's account of poetry, the poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth the form of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to air enough for a local habitation in the name. I thought I'd made this entirely original move to see, oh, wait a minute, this is a riff on the prologue to John's Gospel. And that there is a pack, you know, there in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and same, you know, and then the word was made flesh, bodied forth, literally given a local habitation and a name. Mm -hmm. That our move as poets to try and take what would otherwise be abstract or unspoken or a, a kind of fleeting peripheral mm -hmm, vision mm -hmm. and build for it a habitation, make a beautifully structured poem, mm -hmm. woo the insight into the image, let the image body forth the insight. Mm -hmm. That this is a kind of incarnation. It's a kind of little incarnation mm -hmm. modeled on the great incarnation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I just wrote a whole book on the basis of that. Then, uh, when I was coming to write my most recent volume of poetry, um, David's Crown, which is a sequence of poems responding to the Book of Psalms, I naturally returned to C.S. Lewis's Reflections on the Psalms, mm -hmm. the late sure. great book, which full, has some of his best comments on poetry, because there's a whole section in that where he talks about the Psalms as poetry, mm -hmm. as poems in themselves, and how they should be read as poems and shouldn't be read as syllogistic theological texts, you know, that, that you bring a different set of appreciations and parameters and you you make allowances for, for 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 the sudden elisions from one image to another and you actually say that's teaching me something it's not a logical connection it's an imagistic or poetic connection yeah. as in you know his favorite um you know 19 where you go yeah. from the image of the sun to the image uh, to the ideas about the law of god and mm -hmm. it's not explicitly the sun is like this and this is like the law. Right. it's just you know you they naturally move from one to the other now in his 
Um, in the reflections on the Psalms, I suddenly found, and I must have read it, and it was buried in my mind, a sure. passage where he says, when the one who created all things chose to enter his creation and then to teach, it was natural that he should use poetic language and poetry and mm -hmm. should recite the Psalms himself. For every poem is a little incarnation. Oh. And just this one little phrase, every yeah. poem is a little incarnation. Yeah, yeah. That was the seed of this whole thing that I developed. And I, there it was. Oh. Jack had got there first. <laughs> he doesn't develop it. I mean, yeah. it's a beautiful thing. It is yeah, a yeah, seed. Yeah. He just throws it out. And I have developed it. But I didn't even know until really recently that it had any source other than my own, you know, yeah, I yeah, see yeah. it like that. But obviously I see it like that because in some sure, way, sure. you know, Lewis, so I can... Which is one of the great I advantages can, of rereading. Yeah, I can, I can honorably repay that debt now. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I think, I think there's, there's Lewis. Obviously, when Lewis was on at Poets' Corner, mm -hmm. um, it'll be 10 years ago next year. Next year, it? yeah. He was being honoured not simply for his poetry, but right. for the, the poetic quality right. in all his works. And there, I think, the Shakespearean definition, to which, in a sense, he's alluding when he says, every poem is a little incarnation, a body and forth. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, that really works. I mean, what Lewis does supremely is to take ideas which previous writers have reduced to abstractions and right. syllogisms and actually body them forth in Transpose one them. beautiful, lucid analogy or mm -hmm. symbol after another, and then, you know, supremely, I think, in the Narnia Chronicles, you know, the sheer golden goodness of Aslan, and yet his wildness as well. Yes, 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 yes. So yes. many true things are bodied forth. Yeah. As true things are bodied forth in The White Witch or in the beautiful, you know, episode of The Undragoning of Eustace. So I think Lewis was a poet in his prose, in the sense, mm -hmm. both his fictional prose and his apologetic prose. I remember when I was corresponding with Alistair McGrath, when around that same time, as I was asked to guest edit a special edition of the journal Theology in honor of Lewis, mm -hmm. because Lewis had quite often contributed to theology. I mean, I think mm -hmm. Friends Seed and Elements, yeah, Elements Midler, was, was published yeah. in in, uh, in theology, and he was at odds, of course, with a lot of the sort of demythologizing, you know, Bultmann esque yep, yep, approach yep. of theology. And I thought to myself, oh, you know, things have changed since then. And I was able, because, you know, it was theology, I, I was able to get, you know, Ron Williams and Alistair McGrath and mm -hmm. Richard Balcombe and various people. And Richard Balcombe was really interesting. He talked about how actually more scholars would agree now with what he, Lewis said in Fern Seed and Elephants than would mm -hmm. disagree, you know, the state would be a term for that. But I asked. Alistair and I knew that we were both going to speak at the Westminster Abbey right. at Margaret's. And we thought, well, we can think this through in the articles for theology. So when I asked him to think about Lewis's, I tried to do as a reason and imagination thing. Sure, so sure. I asked him to think about Lewis's rational, you know, apologetics. Mm -hmm. And I was going to look at Lewis's, if you like, imaginative apologetics. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon we started corresponding and Basically, you know, Alice McGrath said to me, well, I can't really exclude the imagination from Lewis's rational apologetics because the best bits of it are a series of beautiful illustrations, you know, whether it's horrid red things or whether it's, you know, yeah. the analogy of diving or... Well, meantime, I was realizing that, in fact, embedded into his greatest imaginative fictions are very clear rational arguments, like mm -hmm. the arguments that mm -hmm. take place in, in the silver chair yep. about the fundamental nature of the reality of whether things are greater or lesser is the symbolized thing in the cat and the lion and the... Yeah, the yeah, yeah. So we realized that although we were giving talks on one to allegedly on his rational apologetic, mm -hmm. that these things were actually completely mutually enfolded, which is unsurprising because in the great poem, to go back to his poems, in the great poem, which was titled Reason, mm -hmm. falsely as it turns out, I mean, quite understandably, I mean, Walter sure. Hooper just saw that was the main thing right at the beginning of it. Yeah. So he, you know, he set on the soul's Acropolis, the reason sure. stands, a virgin on. But there, what Lewis, just pre-conversion, I don't, McGrath is really interesting on this. I assumed yeah. that that poem would be the late 20s, that he must have been so close, certainly to the theistic conversion. Mm -hmm. But I thought even really close to the Christian conversion because he asks the question, 
who will reconcile and mean both maid and mother? Uh, yeah. Who will who make imaginations dim, exploring touch ever report the same as intellectual sight? Right. The answer to that question is so obviously Christ. You know, I think it must be really close to it. But in fact, McGrath thinks it might have been much earlier. He thinks that poem might be 1926 or 1927. Mm. So if you think, you know, I mean, just for, for the listeners who might not be familiar with that poem, I mean, you know, Lewis figures or shows forth the, the human soul, his own, but all of ours, as like ancient Athens, with on the one hand the beautiful clarity and geometry of the, the Parthenon, you know, with, which represents reason and Athene, but then the kind of deep mystery religions and the wombing and fertile mm-hmm. dark, which mm-hmm. represents, you know, it's, it's figured forth by Demeter. In the poem, so you may remember it was set on the soul's Acropolis. Right. The reason stands a virgin arm commercing with celestial light, and he who sins against her has defiled his own virginity. No cleansing makes his garment white so clear as reason. Mm-hmm. So if a thing is the case and demonstrably the case, you can't say it's not the case because you'd like it not to be the case. Right. There. Right. There are inconvenient truths, Mm -hmm. we know, and they remain true. So clear is reason. But how dark, imagining, warm, dark, obscure, an infinite daughter of night, uh, her with her eyes with sleep, her eyes are loaded, and her pains are long, and her delight. Mm -hmm. So there's the the kind of fertile imagination. Right. Tempt not Athene. Wound not Demeter in her fertile pains, nor rebel against her mother right. Oh, who will reconcile in me, both maid and mother? He needs, it's a fascinating poem, yeah. because he takes these two principal faculties of reason and imagination right. and figures or embodies them forth poetically right. in the form of two goddesses well, and who the needs reason to reconcile. Is, reason is supported by imagination. Yeah. Michael Ward uh, gave us a, a talk a couple of weeks ago yeah. for the, uh, yeah. the Northwind folks. And... Literally, reason is supported by imagination in that poem because Athena is standing on top of a hill, the soil of which is Demeter, mm. right? Absolutely. And it, of course, eventually in the Blue Spells and Florilanus spheres, he brings it together and says, reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is right. the organ of meaning. So it was scarcely surprising that um, Alice McGrath and I found that we couldn't separate sure. these faculties, that sure. they were, in fact, you know, mutually enfolded. And um, and it's that cohesion in Lewis, too, that you kind of find popping up all over the place. Um, yeah. I know we need to, to, to get you on your way. Um, I love that at the beginning of Narnia, mm. the proper response is to fall silent, right? The cabbie yeah. says, yeah, now's not the ta- time to talk. Yeah, stow, stow the noise, governor. Yeah. Right. But what does he, the only expression he feels is, I, 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 I think of singing a hymn. Yeah. Right? But at the end of Narnia, yeah. what's the last thing taken away? They come to Aslan, and I've talked about this in other contexts until we have faces, but they come to Aslan, the animals do, and if they look at him with hatred and fear, they fall silent. They become no longer talking beasts. Yeah. But if they look at him with love, they enter into Aslan's kingdom and they remain, they, they, they retain the power of speech because now they know yeah. how to use it and they've used it wisely and well, unlike so many of the others yeah. in the last battle. Yeah. Well, of course, this gift of speech, this gift of language is astonishing. I mean, Jesus is very clear about it. He says, you know, um, says, by thy words shalt thou be mm-hmm. condemned, by the words shalt be saved, you know. Um, you mustn't call a, your brother Rachel fool, mm-hmm. you know, in danger. You know, so so actually, weighing words and the responsibility of being, yes. as the old Anglo-Saxon poems describes human beings as red barren word bearers. Yes, yes. You know, is really, uh, and it's really significant. Um, but again, you honour language both by using it as well as you can, but also by putting it in its proper place and saying there are mysteries into which it cannot penetrate, but it can do its best to. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I think. The best human language about God is the language of response Mm -hmm. rather than the language of definition. It's not that we Mm -hmm. try and create the categories into which God fits, but that the the actual experience of God pushes our language into Mm -hmm. new categories and gives us new ways of thinking and talking. If we're sort of coming towards the end of our discussions, I I wondered if I might actually just um, read you um, the poem I wrote uh, 
for C.S. Lewis, as it were, yes. uh, which I concluded my lecture uh, at St. Margaret's and uh, uh, Westminster in, in at that time, nine years ago. But, but um, yeah, it, it, was, it was, was fun to do. And, you know, you'll know that when he taught Anglo-Saxon, he used to have these sessions called Beer and Beowulf. Sure. And I allude to that. And I allude to Michael Ward's wonderful work on the seven heavens in the imagination yes. of C.S. Lewis. Yes. Those things come to it. I feel I want to, so people have enjoyed this poem and I hope you'll enjoy it too. There's one other little nod that perhaps needs to be brought out. There's a point uh, where I call Lewis ward of a word whore yes. in the yes. deep heart's core. Now, word whore, of course, is an allusion to Anglo-Saxon sure. poetry and Beowulf and the word whore. Um, Deep Heart's Core, I mentioned the first time I spoke to you about it. Deep Heart's Core, of course, is a direct quotation from Yeats's poem, The Lake Isle of Innes Three. I hear lake water, I hear it in the deep heart's core, that although he's treading the pavements grey, he can hear the lake water on the Lake Isle of Innes Three. And I wanted that because I think Lewis should also be considered as an Irish poet. Absolutely. In the tradition of Irish poets, I think his Irishness is there all the way through in his sense of the Irish landscape. And I think there's a, there's good work to be written on on the complex relations mm-hmm. between Lewis and Yeats from yes. the first enthusiastic letters to Arthur Greaves saying, have you seen Yeats? He understands our mythologies perfectly, mm-hmm. you know, um, to the extraordinary portrait of Yeats in Dimer, right. where he becomes the magician and Lewis's anxiety and fear about Yeats's late occultism, mm-hmm. but his delight in Yeats's poetry. It's very interesting, the little preface to uh, the second edition of right. Dimer, right. he pays a, a tribute to Yeats. Uh-huh. And he not you'd think that Lewis would only like the, the Celtic Twilight Yeats, the yeah. Song of the Wandering Angus Yeats. But he likes the modernist Yeats uh-huh. as well. And he talks about Yeats reinventing himself and playing most of the, mod- most of the modernists off the field at their yes. own game. Yes. I don't know if they did, but I wish we had record of talks between Well, they Yeats did meet. And Yeats and, well, no, they absolutely met here in Oxford. Yeah. Um, but Williams and Yeats, there's a picture of the two of them. Yes. And they were in yeah. the Golden Dawn. And I yeah. wonder what Lewis and Williams would have talked about with Yeats. Yeah. About Yeats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway. Yeah, um, do read us that poem. So we'll perhaps just, you know, um, to include what I'm saying with this poem. So, from Beer and Beowulf to the seven heavens, whose music you conduct from sphere to sphere, you are our portal to those hidden havens whence we return to bless our being here. Scribe of the kingdom, keeper of the door which opens unto all we might have lost, ward of a word hoard in the deep heart's core, telling the tale of love from first to last, generous, capacious, open, free. Your wardrobe mind, has furnished us with worlds through which to travel, whence we learn to see along the beam and hear at last the heralds sounding their summons through the stars that sing, whose call at sunrise brings us to our king. Mm. Well, what a great com- contribution to our, our poetry month. Um, and and what a what a, a deeply humble gift that you have given us by making up making some time for us. Yeah, thank this you. That's a, incredible. That's a pleasure. Yeah, that's, uh, they're very intense. These serious Lewis conferences. They're glorious, but they, yes. they drain you too. Well, I'm going to give you a little you. bit of more of my scotch because we always do a toast. All oh, right. Okay. And so we are going to. Uh, thus, um, it is revealed. I've already been sipping it. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, I I replenished yeah. you a little bit, <laughs> and so uh, this okay. is Macallan, twelve year old. Of course, it's Matt's favorite scotch. And today we are toasting uh, Brian Roden, who's a Northland scholar who was here. Oh, right. Oh, uh, very good. And had to go home to get it, welcome a new baby. So to Brian. To Brian. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Well, there's the last, uh, the last bell at the king's arms because the, the eagle and child is, is closed. Malcolm, thanks again so much. Can you tell our listeners where they can go to find out more about you and your various books? Uh, I have a... A blog, which is a WordPress blog. So if mm-hmm. you do Malcolm Guide WordPress, you'd probably find it quite quickly. Great. I need to update all the lists of the books on there. My my, my most recent book, uh, theologically, is a book called um, uh, 
My Theology, The Word Within the Words. It's part yes. of a little series of My Theology with DLT. I also, ever since lockdown, I, because I so missed being in the college and sort of students just walking into my room, knocking on the door and coming mm -hmm. in, and I'd have a chat and I'd pull a book off the shelf. So I've started to do a... Um, a YouTube thing, uh, which I call a spell in the library. Though I think in YouTube it's just got my name on the channel. And yep. I do that uh, as frequently as I can. And where did you do your latest spell in the library? So I did the latest one. I just I went up to the kilns and did it from the kilns. So oh, was fantastic! The room, so well, David's great. great at getting all of those lists yeah. of books. Yeah. Uh, listeners, when Malcolm was visiting us in Virginia, I had a stack of I think all fourteen or fifteen. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so. I think I'm missing still one, but we'll yeah. get uh, we'll we'll put out a list of all of, of Malcolm's books. Okay. Well, thank you again to uh, to Malcolm. Thanks to all for spending us spending this hour with us, and thanks to our Patreon on supporters, especially our top tier supporters, Erica, Marvin, Joelle, Angela, Deborah 1, Deborah 2, Amanda, Thomas, uh, Narnia Mouse, Bill and Joanna, Snort, Bud, Shane, John, Kevin, Brian and Kay, Paul and Kimberly, Gillis and Gary, Stephen, Matt, Kelly, Chris, John, James, Kate, Peter, David and Rowdy. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. We'll be continuing our poetry exploration the rest of the month and then in September wrapping up the season. So please join us next time when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.